So, okay, so as Lorena said, now it's time to get serious in the laboratory, and um, <clears throat> Andy Terrell has offered to help with a Phoenix project. If you'd like to try that, I sent out a paper on implementation of the Poussin-esque equations in Phoenix. So that's a, excuse me? Yeah, he's he's already installed Phoenix uh, Dolphin. Oh, sorry. Well, someone has installed. Thank you very much. Has installed the Phoenix tool set in the lab. So that's definitely an option you can do. And as I, well, I mean, you can just download this code and run it. So it's it's uh, easy to get started if you want to get a, a an idea of what a system like that does. And then it's easy to modify the equation. So if you wanted to play with that that's available to you. Um, and uh, I just wanted to point out that someone asked me a question, what's the GPU support within Phoenix? And there is a paper there to, to look at, and, and there's more work on that coming. Um, if I can make a comment. Yes. That paper shows GPU support for linear algebra back in. It, it's more complicated than just that paper. But for most, for, for non-experts, it doesn't <laughs> okay, fair enough, fair enough. And I also should be mentioning work that you did with, with Matt Connectly as well, I think, yeah, in this regard. Yeah, I'm not going to show, I'm just going to never use the GPU code. Okay, that's fine. So that it's, it, it's a work in progress, and there are, there are ongoing research projects to make it more into the mainstream of, of Phoenix. Yeah, tools, but, but if you want to solve the system on a GPU, that kind of works. So, um, but it is, it is something if you wanted to learn more about, there is more to learn. So that's, um, that's what I wanted to say about uh, GPU uh, with Phoenix so far. The Phoenix book uh, can be downloaded from this. There's no copyright violation that we know of in doing that. It's just that if I were to give it to you, that apparently is copyright violation. But you go there and it says uh, on this, on this web page, it just says download from Launchpad. And it's big because there, there are lots of, lots of pretty pictures in it. So be careful. Do it where you've got some bandwidth. Um, so, okay. So that's, that's one project to think about. And um, another project I'm happy to talk to you about is just following up on these high order methods for, for simple 1D problems. If somebody said, boy, that really seems interesting, I'll mention some open problems there if you are more into a pure programming experience but don't want to get involved in, in one of the larger systems. So, so that's a possibility because all that can be done in Octave or MATLAB or Python or your language of choice. Okay, so um, I want to talk about some challenge problems here. Um, even beyond the, what we're talking about, up to now we're talking about what you have to do. L Lorena misspoke. It, it's not Saturday next week. It's Saturday this week. So today, <laughs> excuse me, today is Tuesday. So you have Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And unfortunately, we schedule talks like this in the mornings and early afternoons. So we're kind of blathering on for the morning. And so you only have the afternoons and evenings to work on this. So you've got to get going on that. So, okay, just a little bit of push there. But, so we're, all, we're looking forward to hearing from you on Saturday. So that's going to be great. But I also want to mention some things that go a little bit beyond, which I think are perhaps problems for the longer term. And there's one I've become aware of. And, and please tell me if this is a solved problem. It may be. I don't know. But I've asked a, a whole bunch of people, and nobody seems to know. But let me make an observation that... Um, you can see by going to the beach here. So, you know, often you have a nice sandy bottom on the beach, and um, water is flowing over it, so there's these waves coming in. And you've probably noticed that you can get these ripples on the bottom. How big, what size are these typically? It's small. Very good answer. See, it's <laughs> ambiguous still, but how small? Meters, centimeters, centimeters, five to this bit, right? That's what you're thinking. I guess that's ten centimeters. 
So I think of it as when you walk on it, you know, you, your foot might hit two of the, the ridges, but it's not, you know, you're not going down and up. It's, you can walk on top of it. Um, do you see waves of that frequency on the surface when it's coming in? No, you don't see short waves like that. What you see are longer waves. So what determines this frequency in the sand? The, the grain size. Okay. Now, are you are you quoting a scientific study, or are you are you saying that's what you think it is? Uh-huh. Good. Could you post something to the PASI site on this? Because I have never heard that good an explanation of it. My, my feeling was grain size was the answer, too, but I couldn't come up with nothing anybody said that I talked to had that kind of level of detail. I, I do when I do Okay. That's the right place for that sort of study. So, yeah, if you could... Uh, if you could post that. And have you seen the ripples that fish make? Oh my god. <laughs> if you can see that, I'll send you a link to that. Some ripples that some fish make. Right. Um, that would be, you'll like that. Now, now, why am I saying this? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, uh, I saw this letter of a guy from Switzerland who lived in Northern Europe who was studying dunes. Yes. They also have this ripple. Yes. Yes. Okay. Good. Okay. Well, if you can again post that to the PASI site, I think that would be very useful. Now, why am I mentioning this? Well, I'm mentioning it because one of the things we haven't talked about much here is bottom friction. And in the experimental papers that I was involved with that uh, or were in the references, uh, we had to do something ad hoc. Um, so the theoretical form of bottom friction, so when a wave comes in here, there's a little friction on the bottom. The correct form of that, the, the um, uh, frequency wavelength relationship, the dispersion relation, is a square root function. Now, a square root function corresponds to a, remember, there's, it's the same as the symbol of a differential operator, except when it's, not a, when it's not a polynomial, it's not a differential operator. It's what's called a pseudo-differential operator. So we knew that, what the proper form was. It's like the tan h, the square root of k tan h k is the correct form for describing water waves. But that's some weird pseudo-differential operator. Nobody ever wants to work with that. So you work with approximations to it, like KDV and BBM. Um, if you wanted to work with the, such pseudo-differential operators, it would boost up the dimension of the problem. Essentially, it, it makes you go to uh, much more complicated models. You can do it. You're doing things by Fourier transform. But it gets m much more expensive. So that's why people have taken uh, simple quadratic approximations. You've heard that in several different talks. So you approximate the dissipation by just a uxx term with the right coefficient, which you've got, to, you've got to fit to the particular frequencies you have. But that's an area where I think we'll see advances. I think your generation will be making these advances and having much more accurate models for 
um, for the bottom friction. And so to me, this is a simple problem. This may be the simplest problem. We should somehow be able to, if, if our models can't predict the size of these waves, which anybody can measure by going to the beach, then we have a problem. So here's, here's something that I think is, is a good thing to keep in mind as a basic problem that we have to be able to solve by our models of the future, including bottom friction and some model of the granular aspect of this. Um, let me remind you, I'll, I'll come back to this, but let me just remind you of one of the pictures that one of the speakers showed early on about the, the first inundation by the tsunami and how black the water was, and somehow it had picked up all this material from the bottom of the bay. We need to keep that in mind. We have to somehow be able to model that. If our models don't do that, and you have to think about how did it do that? That was the first wave. That wasn't like, you know, after an hour of the thing sloshing around in the bay. That seemed to be the first, first wave. And so it means that somehow there's bottom friction picking up this sediment and entraining it into the initial wave as it comes in. So it's very interesting to think about. And as I said, here's your, your basic um, problem to solve. How, what sets this, this dimension given that you've got waves that are coming in at some, some wavelength? So the answer seems to be grain size, and let's see if we can come up with, with models that, that work um, in this context for that. Okay, challenge problem number one. Maybe solved. Um, so here's another challenge problem that may be more mathematical and less interesting from a physical point of view, depending on what comes out. So we've talked about tsunamis, and tsunamis are at, on the order of hundreds of kilometers long in the open ocean, and they're small wavelength, and presumably you know, relatively smooth. Certainly the solutions to KDV or BBM are C infinity solutions. Okay, now how many people have been out in, you know, the open ocean and seen big, you know, five meter ocean waves that oh, look yeah. like they're going to run over you? Yeah, yes. It's like a freight train going to run it's over Patagonia. you. I mean, it's, it's not a lot of fun, and I'm a sailor. I did not um, sign up for that. <laughs> Okay, so now if <laughs> so if I tell you that those waves are ubiquitous in the open ocean, you probably go along with me on that. I of course I haven't been everywhere in the ocean all the time, but I believe that those waves are around all the time. So let's I mean five meter to ten meter even waves. Um, the wavelengths are I'm not I could try to figure this out. Probably we could do it by by simple calculations, but you know on the order of thirty to fifty meters. It, long things. Um, but those are much bigger amplitude and shorter wavelength than tsunami waves. So what's that all about? And these are nonlinear processes, right? All the, all the equations we've been looking at are nonlinear. So you know that only linear things can be superimposed simply, right? So, so how do these high frequency, large amplitude waves relative to tsunamis. How do those interact with tsunamis? Do they interact with tsunamis? Again, I've asked some people, nobody seems to know. This would be a classic homogenization problem. That is, you'd be talking about the slowly varying tsunami wave, smooth, slowly varying, small amplitude wave, with high frequency, large amplitude waves modulated on top of it. And if you have ever seen materials science lectures, you know that people have thought about this. This occurs in lots of materials applications. And you know that sometimes those high-frequency waves can, can change this, the material properties, or the effective material properties. So question, does that have any effect here? I have no clue. My bet is the answer is no, because I'm just guessing that historically, People have thought about this, people like Stokes probably would have thought about it, and figured out some simple way of thinking about it that says, ah, forget it, that, that has no effect. Um, and I'm happy to believe that. I'm happy to believe, A, there is no interaction. But if that's right, then there would be potentially a mathematical proof of the sort of the derivation that you've 
you know, you der derive KDV from Navier-Stokes, and um, you could presumably do that sort of homogenization in that context. So I'll throw that out as a, as a mathematical problem that might be of some interest. Of course, if the answer were B, that would be very interesting. If there's some effective medium that we should be thinking about because of the, 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 these persistent waves, we should know about that. And of course, in the previous talk, this was discussed in the context of near-shore uh, modeling, uh, where we know it has an effect. So um, an interesting potential math problem. Um, OK, some more challenges. So this one's a little bit more mathematical. I was trying to, you know, I, I took the most important ones to the least important. So maybe, you know, I'm not pushing this, but I'm just saying it seems kind of an inter interesting question. So it's been observed for a long time, um, starting at least in 74 and probably known earlier. This is Hamak and Seeger, um, that if you start with a, a general initial data, uh, water waves break up into a finite number of solitary waves. And using the code that I've described here on your laptop, you can play with this. And you can see that as you increase the amplitude of this, say, a Gau take a Gaussian initial waveform, it'll break up into more and more solitary waves, plus some other stuff, perhaps. But that means quantization. So I've got a continuous amplitude here. I take a Gaussian, and I vary the amplitude continuously. And as I go from one value to the next, it'll go from k to k plus 1 solitons. So that's quantization. So I've got a continuous variable that gets mapped to a discrete variable. So how does it do it? That's the question. So what happens, for example, at the boundary, where as you move the amplitude infinitesimally, you go from k to k plus 1. What does that look like? What's the quantization process like? So this is a pure math question, no, no doubt about it. But it's one that, through computation, you could gain some insight and, as, into what's going on. Um, so, OK, I throw that out there as just another challenge problem that one could think about. Um, if you wanted to do that, you might decide at a certain point that you really need much higher order schemes. These problems are very smooth. Um, and so there, it's appropriate to use extremely high order methods the difficulty is that they also are very, they, they require a long time to resolve. Um, as the amplitude, so here's one thing to think about. Suppose I want to ask, what's the boundary between zero soliton generated and one soliton generated? So that means the smaller amplitudes. So but when the amplitude is small enough, no solitary waves get generated. You just get one of these dispersive tails. So where is the point at which one soliton, what amplitude is it, and what wavelength is it that, by wavelength I mean I make, make the Gaussian wider or narrower, what's that boundary look like between no solitary waves and one solitary wave? Well, that small amplitude, so everything is pretty much traveling at the same speed. With the larger amplitudes, the bigger solitons come out quickly and move off quickly, and so things happen very quickly. But for the smaller solitary waves, they all move at about the same speed. And so you have to wait a long time to figure out if they've been separated or not. So that's a situation where you might want a very high order spatial and temporal discretization. So here's a numerical analysis challenge. And let me just say a little bit about the scheme I've described here, which is a fourth order scheme. And it was of this form. So ut was given by two terms. f is the nonlinear term, say u plus u squared. And we, we solved, this was really this, the, the form of the second order problem here. This is a, a, a three-point difference stencil. The coefficients are a little bit funny. They involve these exponentials. Um, and this is a first order difference, again, three-point stencil. And then the second term also comes from taking a simple three-point difference stencil. So in a way, you could say this is a, well, I'll do the big circle here, this is a fourth-order scheme that involves a compact difference stencil involving three points. 
So when I, I once gave this talk years ago, Mac Hyman was in the audience. And Mac said, Bridge, you can't do that. You can't have a fourth order scheme with three points. And so we had this discussion, and I explained, you know, it's not, uh, it's not of the usual form of it, because it's, there are two parts to it. So, um, but it is interesting that computationally you get away with just dealing with three-point stencils, although you put them together in a way that, that violates Max, Max theorem. So that's all that's fine. Um, and what, if you remember, this term only comes from the derivative correction in the euler mclaurin formula. This term is the trapezoidal rule part. Now, euler mclaurin can be arbitrary order accuracy depending on how many derivative terms you add. So that means you can go to as high order you want by just modifying this part of the problem, making this higher and higher order accuracy, including more derivatives, so first order, third order, fifth order, and so forth, and at each order, increasing the number of points. So I, 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 in, in, in this problem, I only had to have this term second order because it's got an 8 squared in front of it to get a fourth order correction. So I could do that with three points. The next level, I'll have to have a, have a, a six order term. I'll have to have a five point difference stencil to approximate the derivative term. I only need five points to do the third derivative, but that'll only be second order accurate, but that's okay because it's multiplied by h to the fourth, and so on. So by just modifying this term, you can get as high a degree as you want, of course, wider stencil. So there's another problem to think about that might be useful for examining the, the previous question. Okay. Now, I have sort of one take-home message that I would like to suggest, and that is that as a community, we need to be giving the best possible recommendations to the public about tsunamis. And at the time of the J Japan tsunami, there was something happened that I think we could have averted. Um, so there were no deaths. There were no deaths to... to people who heeded the warnings in, in the U.S. coast. The, the system worked. The, the tsunami warning went out. Um, people got boats out of harbors. Big fishing boats were taken out into the open water so that they wouldn't be bounced around in their harbors. Everything worked fine, except there were these three people here. So this is, again, you know, from a press report. And so this three guys go down to look at the tsunami coming in. They heard it was coming in. Uh, near Crescent City, California, and um, they were fine. They, they photographed the first wave coming in, and one of the guys decided he wanted to go down and see the devastation sort of firsthand after the first wave. And you remember the frequency of these waves, like half an hour. So he's down there, and the second wave comes in, and the second wave got him, and he was swept out, and the body was never found. So I think we need to tell people that if you, if, if you see a tsunami wave, you should expect another one, and maybe another one, another one. Don't just think it's a single wave coming in. So there's some controversy about this, I know, but we need to come up with some recommendations that educate people about how to react to these, because this poor guy thought it was a single wave, and then he was, you know, clear to go down and, and examine the, you know, what happened, the boats all being torn up, and the docks being torn up, and so forth. Okay. So that's my, my preaching for the, for the day. Okay. Um, and then um, I, I talked earlier about the fact that what comes in is not blue water. It's very black stuff in some cases. So there's, there's sediment being, being dredged up. And, um, and then certainly um, in any sort of coastal inundation, the water gets very mixed up with debris. And so I'm, again, I'm, I'm looking 20 years to the future and what kinds of things you ought to be thinking about then. Um, so water doesn't behave like water when it's got a bunch of junk in it. And it behaves like what's called a non-Newtonian fluid. Um, and so maybe it's time to think a little bit about 
non-Newtonian models of fluids for the phase of tsunamis where it's on the land and, and coming in. And I don't know how practical that is at this point, but I just wanted to say a little bit about it. Um, okay, so now um, let me just see. I wanted that's the end of these slides, and then I wanted to do, I'm going to do multimedia here, and I realize that, let's just see if I can pick this up, I don't know, this is a little bit risky, but let me just see if I can find this, here's a nice tsunami webpage, but that's not, um, Uh, yeah, okay, so I don't think I should try to do this, but let me just say that there is a very nice um, movie on the web about non-Newtonian fluids, and um, it was actually, it was done somewhere in South America, I've never figured out where, and it shows people, so what you do is you put cornstarch in water, and it behaves very strangely, and you can actually walk on this fluid. So as you go, if you go across it quickly, uh, it behaves like a solid. But if you stop, you can sink in. But how many people have seen this movie? It's very famous. Okay, so good. I don't have to show you. You know this movie. I would love to know. I would love to have simultaneous translation of that at some point because it, it's very funny. I, I have no idea what they're saying. Oh, there's Sp it, there, it's Spain and not yeah. South America. Oh, I didn't realize that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, that shows my ability to Spanish accents. Zero. Um, okay. So, so let me just say a little bit here. Um, and I apologize for using some old slides here. I really wasn't sure how far I would go into this. This is more the research, current research topics in, in fluids, but um, I. I thought I would just give you a little view into what's going on in the world of, of non-Newtonian fluids. Um, so, and, and it also gives me an excuse to go back to my three-legged stool. So remember the three-legged stool, I said there are three parts to this. That it's all about simulation, and that's, as I said, that's why I think people are paying us to be here, <coughs> to be able to simulate processes. And um, it's complicated. So. Here's the stack as I see it. Um, so um, you've got to go from physics down to computer science, if you will. And somewhere in here is some maths and numerical analysis. So, you know, you, does your model capture the main physics? You may have to do some research on this. Um, is the model you come up with well posed? So there's a concept of local solvability where it's known that certain equations don't have a reasonable solution in any sense what, whatsoever. So there's, there's a physics to math issue before you've even started to program. And, and so a key question when you get some new equation, is the numerical scheme stable and consistent? And I've shown you a little bit of how you can prove that about the BBM scheme. Um, and then there's this fundamental question, is the computation feasible? or not. The previous speaker basically said that finite elements are not feasible in most people's minds. I think that's a fair statement. It's just when you show them the methodology, they say, no. Finite difference. I'll do finite difference. And so, um, that's an interesting question. And, and the Phoenix Project has been uh, attempting to address this by looking into the question of automation of software. And so, that's the way I think about it. Phoenix is a, a group of people who get together and say, how can we automate scientific simulation software. Uh, finite elements is one of the primary targets because that is one of the harder ones to do. But it isn't just uh, finite elements, although you can argue that the FE here stands for finite elements. You can also, this is a, a polymorphic acronym. You can, it stands for lots of things. I always think of it as for everything new in computational science. So that's another way to think of what that means. Uh, so, you know, you have to write a code, you need adaptivity, multi-grid, you need to run on a parallel computer. There's this stack that you have to go through. And, um, you know, often we think about our challenge is to solve the equations better. So that's this part down here in red. That's the, once we figured out what the equations are, how do we do them better? 
But I've been arguing that, that part of that three-legged stool is solving better equations. So we have to go back and talk about the physics, and we talked about dispersion a lot here, and the Poussinesque equations, and so forth, and so on. And now I want to talk a little about non-Newtonian fluids. So it, bear with me a little bit here. I'm just I'm raising the physics question and asking what that does to us. Uh, and this is what makes mathematical software hard. I, so computer scientists basically don't understand what's difficult about computational science. And the reason they don't is their approach is to say, show me a simple kernel problem, and then I'll generalize from that forever. So they look, you know, you tell them, well, here's a finite difference problem in one dimension. And they say, oh, that looks easy. What's the big deal? Of course, what we know is you have to do mesh generation. And this is still something that's not fully understood. Um, if you're working with something like finite elements, you have to have function spaces. And this invokes a part of mathematics that's fairly complex. Um, and you often will have very complicated equations. It's not just the simple equations, it's a collection of equations. Often that gets done by, at the moment, that's multi-physics codes, meaning codes that do different physics and they're brought together, as was shown in the previous talk. Um, but if you wanted to put that into one system, you'd have to have uh, 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 some sort of language for expressing complicated physics. And then you need solution algorithms, um, parallel computing support, and so forth. So this is what makes it hard. I'm, I'm preaching to the converter here. I don't need to, but, but I think it's important if you are beginning to interact with people in computer science, you need to explain to them what makes it hard. Okay. Well, so one thing that certainly makes it hard is the set of equations. And I've talked here about KDV and BBM. And um, one of the problems with BBM from a certain point of view is that it doesn't have the exact solitary wave interaction property. But Kamasa and Holm developed a similar equation with these modification terms, which are lower order in terms of modeling, that does have the exact problem. And, and that is interesting from the following point of view. That system can be written here succinctly, but now in terms of two variables, a u and a v variable. And notice this relationship which occurs in the BBM model. So u and v are related by the simple elliptic operator, which we use in the code to, to make things high order accurate. And so you've got v satisfying an advection equation involving u, and u is related to v by this operator. OK. Now, I mentioned that, well, for a variety of reasons. It sort of completes the picture of KDV, BBM, and then a modified BBM that has the exact solitary weight interaction. Um, but it also leads to a three-dimensional form. So let me just click back and forth here. You see there's a v and a u. And u and v are related by the same elliptic operator. But now we're in three dimensions. So the jump from Kamasa home to three dimensions is very natural, modulo the way you view the advection term in here. But that's, the, that's what it is in, in the three dimensional case. And so here is a dispersive wave equation in three dimensions. And let's just take a look at it. So it looks a little bit like Navier. If this was u, then this would be a Navier-Stokes term. And if v were u, this would look like a Navier-Stokes equation. That may not be, this may not look like the normal advection term, but it is equivalent to the normal u dot grad u term, modulo a change in what you mean by pressure. So in fact, this does reduce to the Navier-Stokes equations if you take alpha zero. So alpha is this parameter here. In the, so if alpha is zero, then u is equal to v, and you get the Navier-Stokes equations. So in short, we, we played around with KDV and BBM, looked at the Kamasa home modification, which is, has this nonlinear small amplitude changes to it, so not a big change, and then immediately saw that it could be generalized to three dimensions. This is a weird way to come up with these equations, but it is a way to come up with these equations. And, and it turns out 
these equations are one of the simplest uh, non-Newtonian models, and it includes a dispersive behavior. So, um, a more classical way to derive these equations is by looking at the history. And Ritalin and Erickson, uh, early pioneers in mechanics, um, derived it in, in a very rational way, as I'll try to describe it. <clears throat> so, the mechanics of, of any fluid like materials is very simple in the sense that the advective derivative of, of the velocity is driven by the divergence of the stress. So, here's the advective derivative, uh, ut plus u dot grad u. So, that's what this means. And that's equal to the di divergence of the stress. That's pretty general. The question is, how does the stress depend on the strain? How does the stress depend on the velocity? Well, there, that's not so simple. But what Ritalin and Erickson did was to do an expansion based on rational mechanics, thinking you have, have to have symmetries and blah, blah, blah. And they came up with this expression. And I won't try to go through all of that thinking, but to say that at the first order term in their expansion, they derived the Navier-Stokes equation. So they, they, uh, this is an expansion for the stress, and they say the stress is related to the, the gradient of the velocity, these a's, that are just something involving the gradient of the velocity. So that just works out to be the Navier-Stokes equation. And then this second term in the expansion gives you the previous equation, so the, what's called the grade two model. So here's the, the grade two model where you make this approximation, and lo and behold, that's what appears when you write it out in the usual form. So here are two different ways that you can think about deriving these equations. Coming from Kamasa and Holm, you know it's a dispersive approximation. Um, and, and coming from here, you, you know it's somehow the, the next order term after Navier-Stokes in, in this expansion. Um, these equations uh, appear in many guises. There's a way of thinking about fluid flow um, via geometry of maps. I'll just say that's here if you want to interpret it. You can see that um, you can see that the Euler equations uh, arise in this context, um, and by using a different geometry on an infinite dimensional manifold of, of these functions. Um, you can um, see that the, um, um, the grade two model is related to the Euler equation in a simple way by just changing topology on this function space. Rather abstract, but um, it's the, the Euler equations end up being uh, geodesics on this manifold, related to geodesics on the manifold, and, and the grade two model also relates to geodesics with a different topology. So, an abstract interpretation to that. Um, it's also the case that Rivlin and Erickson realized this would be a potential turbulence model. From their point of view, this was the first term that came up from their expansion. And so, reasoning that, you know, any, any Turbulence is something which involves uh, a closure, and, and if you just ask what's the next term in the expansion, it would be natural to consider that. So they, they did that. Um, and later, uh, or more recently, much more recently, um, a group of people have used it as a turbulence model and looked at some experiments in it in a channel. So, so this has some um, credibility in that, in that setting. And then finally, uh, it appears in... Um, an interpretation of what's called the vortex blob method. So Chorin in introduced this vortex method, which um, allows you to, to approximate a fluid in terms of point vortices, so little delta functions of vortex. And they move around according to a simple ordinary differential equation. But they, as a numerical method, it has some limitations. And so what were called vortex blobs were introduced that were sort of Gaussian approximations to delta functions, and they would move around according 
to a, an appropriate equation. And it turns out that um, the grade two equation is a closer approximation to the vortex blob numerical scheme than it is to the original Euler equation. And that's like, like we said, when you take a numerical scheme, it's actually a better approximation to the higher order differential equation with a small parameter coming from the next side. Same deal here. Okay, so the grade two equation comes up naturally in many contexts. So <coughs> one question to ask, my first question is, well, what does it do to flow problems? And um, for internal flows, one of the most effective simple problems to look at is the lubrication approximation. The lubrication approximation works as follows. Suppose you've got a boundary like this, or it could be a free surface, the top could be a free surface, same thing works. And you have a flow profile going through this, you have fluid flowing through here. Um, you can make the assumption that at each point here, you've got a simple profile that might vary as you, you go through, but otherwise, that's the, that's the flow. So it just has a simple profile at every step. And if you make the assumption that this channel is slowly varying, either the free surface or the solid walls are slowly varying, you can reduce this to an ordinary differential equation for the profile as a function of the, the vertical height, depending perhaps on the thickness or the, the width of the, of the channel and also the, the speed or flow, so, uh, the flow. So there's a, a Reynolds number parameter that comes in like this and allows you to compute things, and I apologize if this is hard to see, but this is um, the flow profile in, uh, in a wavy channel as a function of that, that uh, Reynolds number parameter. And um, so um, this is Newtonian flow. So what you know for Newtonian flow, it's, it's parabolic if the channel is straight. But if the channel is increasing in width, you get essentially unstable flow. That's the, the green curve here. And no, the, the dotted ones. And if it's contracting, then it's stabilized, and that's the green curve. So this is. Um, in fact, this is essentially Jeffrey Hamble flow in the case of Newtonian flow. You can do the same kinds of expansions with uh, and approximations with the grade two model. And what you see is a, let's say, by taking a, a very small non Newtonian parameter alpha equal to uh, one over the Reynolds number. Uh, so we're thinking of you know, modest Reynolds number. And so this is a small parameter. But what it does is it collapses the flow around the parabolic profile. So this dispersive term is a very strong term in the grade two flow model. So it's interesting. So a very little bit goes a long way with this model. Okay. Um, and it destabilizes, it acts like a thinner if the, if the parameter is negative. So uh, it, it, it has some interesting, interesting effects. So I want to just sort of close by saying a little bit about what's known about this if you wanted to play around with it. And again, I'll refer you to Andy Carroll, who's done extensive calculations on these non-Newtonian flows using Phoenix. Um, the structure of the system you can understand a little bit by simplifying it to two dimensions, taking away the time derivative, so just looking at the steady state and seeing what the structure is. And what you get is something that looks very much like the, the Navier-Stokes equations with a complicated nonlinearity. So this is incompressible flow, it's the Stokes part, and then this is the advection term. And so we've got, let's just go through this. So um, um, u is a vector, so u1 and u2 are the components of u. And I've written here a new vector where I've taken the first component to be u2 and the second com component to be minus u1. So that gives me a vector. So Laplacian is a vector. Fred P is a vector. P is the pressure. And I multiplied that vector by a scalar z. Z is a scalar function that satisfies this auxiliary equation, which I'll say something about in a second. But it, z depends on u. So it's a coupled system of two equations. So it looks a lot like the Navier-Stokes equations, but with a funny 
term coming from here. Okay, so now what about this equation? What's the nature of this equation? Well, it's a simple advection, a linear advection problem. You're going to, it's, it's going to be, it's got a directional derivative in the direction of, of the flow u, and what's driving it is the curl of u. So this is, this is something, this is the vorticity, and you're, you're driving it with the vorticity. So you're, this information is being pushed along streamlines of the flow with some damping. Okay, so that's what's happening. So the way I think about it is this non-Newtonian model is Newtonian plus some information some modified by information that's driven along the streamlines. And I think that's characteristic of many of these. So information flows along the streamline. One way to think about it is this. So you have water. It's picked up some twigs from the bottom of the, the bay. And these twigs are going to align in the flow. And, and when something happens here, it's going to have an effect at a distance because you get, a, you get, mo you get effects at a distance because the twigs are bigger than the water molecules. So that's, that's what this equation looks like. Um, so uh, this problem is, is fairly simple. I'm just thinking about you know, decoupling them and seeing how they, they behave. So that problem is, is fine in terms of, of this nonlinear term. That's not a big deal. But this equation is very touchy. And um, so you may say, well, I don't want to work with this problem. That's fine if you don't. But uh, it is something that uh, is at the limits of what we understand about, in a sense, ordinary differential equations. This is really an ordinary differential equation parameterized. So for each streamline, you've got a different ordinary differential equation defining z in terms of the, the right-hand side. But miraculously, you can show that this problem is well posed, even though as an ordinary differential equation, it doesn't satisfy the usual Lipschitz condition. That is, what we want to do is we want to use this in a case where u is in some Sobolev space to apply finite elements, and in that setting, it's not smooth enough to think about this ordinary differential equation as being as having a Lipschitz function. So uh, it is somewhat surprising that there is um, existence and uniqueness in an appropriate space. And the appropriate space is kind of silly in a way. You just say, okay, well, what space could a solution exist in? Well, let's say you've got, this is coming from the curl of u. If u is in H1, Sobolev space H1, usual Sobolev space for finite elements. Then f is in L2, the square integrable. So let's just define a space where z is square integral and this complicated combination is square integral. Turns out that makes perfectly good sense, and you can show that solutions exist in a unique and that space. So, so this is a well-posed problem, and um, we've been able to uh, prove some things about numerical methods, so there is some foundation for this. Um, the, this transport equation, uh, it's natural to introduce a, 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 a way to deal with this possibility that, that divergence zero is, is violated in the numerical schemes, like I think of this as a master equation. This red term would not be there if you picked finite elements that satisfied exact divergence zero. But if you do have, say, the Taylor Hood uh, non zero divergence, you have to include that to get uh, good behavior, but that does work. Um, okay, so there are theorems that want to prove about that. Um, and um, some questions about the sign of alpha, which I will skip over, but um, in the interest of time, mention one other equation. So there's another model that's very well known, the Oldroyd-D model, and Oldroyd proposed um, a, a set of models derived in a way complementary to what Rivlin and Erickson did. And um, so uh, it involves, again, information moving along streamlines. This is what's called an upper convected Maxwellian derivative. And um, so they propose a, a model for the stress um, given by, by this equation. So there's a, 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 this upper convected derivative 
um, plus the stress is equal to the, the gradient of, of u. So that's a, a different way. Before we had a derivative of, of this expression, and now we have an equation with this as a right-hand side. And so it's, it's, they're, they're inverse to each other. And um, you can compare the grade 2 and old droid D models, and they have uh, sort of a duality in the sense that you can view one as related to the other by a simple change of, of coefficients and that at least have been observed practically to be uh, asymptotically equivalent when the parameters are small, as you tend to the obvious first equation. Um, and here is the way to think about it. You think of this differential operator, and one, one equation um, is in terms of the inverse of this operator, and the other is in terms of this, and this is this well-known um, approximation from, from calculus. So, okay, so maybe I should uh, summarize and we'll get to coffee early. Um, the uh, non-Newtonian fluids are very complicated. Um, there are way too many models. Some people joke that there are more models than there are modelers, implying that the modelers weren't sure about their models. Um, but there are some ad mathematical advances that are being made. And what I've talked about here is really the tip of the iceberg. And, and more advanced um, methodologies are invoking stochastic models to understand the interaction between the microscale, where the, the twigs are affecting the fluid flow, and the, and the macro scale, which is where we need to be um, making our predictions. So this is just one small step in that direction, and the, the uh, more, more sophisticated models are, are being um, learned about every day. So it's, it, it's something to think about if you want uh, to look at. Um, the, the Phoenix tools allow you to play around with these different equations very easily, see what the solutions look like. And um, I think I'll stop and see if there are any questions. Maybe